On today's episode, we will give our brief thoughts on President Oaks's talk and go over some general themes that we noticed at General Conference. And in re- relation to that, we figured it would be a great time to go over some of the parallels that we see between ancient antichrists and modern ideologies. All of that and more today on this episode of Sit Down with Sky and Preston. Okay, we are back after conference weekend. I hope everyone had a Woo-hoo. good conference weekend. I know that I did. And Ditto. sounds like Preston did as well. Played a lot of bocce ball, was it? Yeah, with Taryn and my siblings. I uh, thoroughly lost. <laughs> no. It's fun. <laughs> I can't picture that. Yeah, it was fun. We'd watch a session of conference, eat food, go play bocce ball in the yard. Repeat. <laughs> <laughs> I I have like, I have the potential to have very sporty genes, but I just never really pursued that and so i just wasted them i'm sorry for your loss <laughs> thank you <laughs> i did not have those genes <laughs> um, i think my brother stole it all yeah i played like i played tennis in high school for for a year and that was fun and i was decent at it but other than that yeah yeah want want <laughs> want want all right what are some of the highlights from conference then sky well to start off here we we just wanted to just address because it's kind of been on everyone's minds and in everyone's feeds everyone's talking about the horrible awful no good very bad down h oaks talk which we thought was great (laughs) yeah i'm you think people would get to a point where they realize it's not gonna change i don't know yeah but yeah and it, we, we just wanted to just like address that really quick because um i think it would kind of be the elephant in the room if we didn't but mm-hmm. um just some key takeaways i had from it was that we as members of the church just have we have a very i guess unique view of the gospel and god's plan um and especially the afterlife as mm-hmm. compared to like traditional christianity or catholicism meaning they believe in just heaven or hell yeah it's very split down the middle right two groups yeah and just like how emblematic the our view of the afterlife is of a loving god um because we are like as as humans as um, a species we are so there are so many different gradations of good and bad between us so like if if the next life was just a cut down the middle heaven or hell that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense Mm -hmm. and it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for yeah again people right i love the plan of salvation and the way that elder oaks laid it out because again it's it's more intuitive and like the more i've learned about the plan of salvation the more i'm like oh yeah god knew we would only like him and follow him by degrees so he made degrees of glory kingdoms of glory that were separated by degrees yeah it's just it makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. the more you learn about it yeah i also liked the emphasis on um, personal agency how Mm -hmm. it's really up to us like our destiny it's it's all in our hands it's all within our control we um we are given all of this information all of uh we the gospel like all of all of the information that we need to know to be successful Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously not everything but like in order to be successful. We, yeah, to we, reach we the highest level of, of salvation or exaltation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, I loved his comment about, like, God's not going to teach us to aim less than the best. Like, right. there, he, he made a point to say, like, we don't know much about two of these kingdoms of glory because God's not trying to persuade us to go to those kingdoms. He's trying to call us home to become like him and live with him again. And so that's where the majority of the doctrine lies is how do we attain exaltation? How do we go back to live with Father in heaven again? And how do we become like him so we'll want to stay? Mm-hmm. And so I just think that's interesting. And then he he made a really interesting comment too. And he and he and I think he followed this pattern a few times in his talk, but he just said like, if you have a problem with this, you don't understand this. If you have mm-hmm. a problem with this, it's because you don't understand this. And like he did a very good job laying out where there is a gap in doctrinal understanding and why therefore that might lead to some 
um, disgruntled uh, attitudes towards the plan of salvation and the doctrines taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Yeah, and like I can fully empathize with when you're when you're in a, a situation where you like you you were making a comment while we were planning and mm -hmm. Taryn, your wife, when at the end of one of the talks, um, which one was it about abuse? Oh, Elder Kieran. At the yeah. end of that talk, she she um, leaned over and asked if that would have been helpful during that time when you were really raw. Mm -hmm. And you said something about how like you don't really know if it was kind of during that time, possibly I not. I don't know if I would have been receptive right. to it, and even though it was really well set. Like it was a great, yeah. great speech, but I don't think I would have. And that's the thing with with Elder or, uh, President Oaks's talk. He what he said was true and was good and was presented very tactfully and very lovingly but there are always going to be those who are not in a position right now to accept what he was saying mm -hmm. and so when you're in that situation you and someone is telling you you need to repent the natural response is you're going to be bitter and you're going to want to lash out and that unfortunately just like the way that social media is set up the most extreme and loud people usually get the most attention. Mm -hmm. The ones with the most um, like louder, extraordinary or bitter reactions to something will get the most attention. Yeah. But I think with all of this, we should be careful not to allow a controversy or the, the loud people <laughs> mm -hmm. um, to distract from all of the 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 rest of the the great messages that were given agreed yeah it would be so unfortunate if somebody saw something online about don h oaks and therefore decided not to listen to any of conference there's way too much good stuff content teaching uh coming from general conference to just dismiss it outright because you don't understand yet some of what elder oaks was teaching or president oaks was teaching right Agreed. Well, we um, yeah, just wanted to address that really quickly and then just kind of give some of our highlights or general themes that we noticed and then apply that to today and the messages that we see in our circles today and how they how the patterns are similar to what was in the scriptures. Yep. All right, Sky. So what was like one of the big ones, one of your favorite talks? So the first one um, that really struck a chord with me was elder bednars he was one of the one of the first to speak mm -hmm. and that's on my list too is it yeah he he um his i guess overall message was heed not what the wicked will say he mentioned that scripture or not scripture that hymn mm -hmm. let us all press on um and in that hymn there's that line uh, let us we will heed not what the wicked will say mm -hmm. and that was his his general message is that um just kind of discerning like the emptiness that comes from the messages of the great and spacious building and the inevitability of the great and spacious building, obviously. Um, and then how keeping covenants is really what empowers us to make good decisions or to have the strength to carry on, I guess, and to not heed what the wicked will say. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of the first one to mention that idea and then I started noticing it in others, but that it kind of became a pattern yeah. through a few of the different talks. Yeah. And I, I love that he references the tree of life vision uh, um, that you were just quoting uh, passages about because there's four groups of people in that vision. And we know that there are four kinds of people in the end four kingdoms or um, and four antichrists that we studied today. Yeah. Or this week. Again, it's just like interesting that that pattern of hmm, these types of people are real. They exist. They're out there. It's mm -hmm. much more um, digestible to think that there are multiple kingdoms of glory. It's not just, again, heaven or hell. Yeah. Um, but I love what he said about holding fast to the word of God from the prophets, from the scriptures, um, from revelation, from the Holy Ghost. So rather than just clinging to the rod, I wrote that down too. Yeah. Holding fast, holding fast rather than clinging. I like that because that implies continuous action over time. And it, it also implied to me too, like not being frantic about it. 
Mm. I don't know. Like being clingy is felt more frantic, whereas holding fast like seems more intentional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I loved that one, and one that I felt like was in great relation to that. I I don't know how to say his name. I know he's from some Scandinavian country based on his name, but he, it was Elder Jorg Glebingart. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll pronounce 70. it how it looks. Clubbing Cl- got. <laughs> Is Clubbing that the one? Got. Yeah, Cl- I, I don't know Clubbing how to say got. it. But he did an amazing job. Quoted a ton of scriptures. But his message was, the prophets are the mouthpieces of God. Believe it or don't. But if you do believe it, live it. And if you don't, gain a testimony of that. <laughs> But I just loved his overarching message, which was they're not called to be popular. They're called to be the mouthpieces of God. Mm-hmm. So if we struggle with something that the prophets say, it means that we need to learn and adjust and make sure that we're understanding the will of God because it will come from the prophets cleanly. Um, and I just love that. I felt like that worked a lot with Elder Bednar's themes about how do we not listen to the loudness of the world. Yeah. And one of them was stick to the the word of God. Yeah. Um, and th- there seemed to be the same across a lot of the talks. Maybe it's just because I, I picked up on it because this is a, a lot of what I do it is like <laughs> with what we do, there's a lot of um, engagement online and mm-hmm. um, defending gospel truths and, and things like that. Um, so another one that was kind of similar in the message was um, Elder Kevin S. Hamilton of the mm-hmm. 70. Um, he talked, he started off talking about authenticity and kind of the difference between the worldly definition and God's definition of authenticity and how the worldly definition um, is, I'd say, I'd say it's closer to um, like becoming complacent with how you are right now mm-hmm. and then being okay with with that and then just kind of leaving it at that and almost like digging in like don't change at all costs yeah. like and how dare be, anybody suggest i change yeah be your authentic self and and for some reason like within this framework being your authentic self means realizing who you are right now like in this moment mm-hmm. so whatever moment that that is that that could be um you could be like a, a have a different number of weaknesses Mm -hmm. and not um be willing to better those yeah so and then obviously the sorry what were you gonna say well i was just gonna say that that quote that he gave like i have a direct quote that i feel like okay um goes with that really well he said while it is indeed good to be authentic we should be authentic to our real true selves as sons and daughters of god with a divine nature and destiny to become like him Mm, yeah on the other side like that's the more doctrinal authenticity that we would want to uh, aspire to yeah is being authentic to our true identity which is our more like our bigger picture identity our Mm -hmm. our eternal identity as a child of god and what that entails well that entails um always progressing and becoming better and um being honest about our weaknesses and overcoming them and and Mm -hmm. all of these things and well then said. he he went into kind of the he, he gave the analogy of if then um, coding in um, is it CSS what what's the oh it could be JavaScript or something different <laughs> languages but I was like I get this I do this almost every day at uh-huh. work using if then in coding languages yeah so I don't know it as well but it still spoke to me and um, I just liked the the very clear like if then that's that's just covenant making if mm-hmm. you do this then this will be the natural consequence or then god will do this mm-hmm. so um one example he gave was if ye shall keep my commandments then ye shall abide in my love meaning god's love and how the the message ab- about god's love has never been that his love is conditional no loving like no perfect father would have conditional love for his child Mm -hmm. but it's up to us if we abide in that love if we um allow ourselves to be in a situation where we can feel that love or where we can receive that love because it goes two ways it's not just um like he can love us all we all he wants but if we are in a situation where 
we are able to receive that love, then it's functionally speaking, it's almost as if he doesn't love us because we don't know any different. Yeah, because we won't know any different. And that's what's interesting is his love is not conditional, but abiding in his love is conditional as any relationship is. Mm -hmm. Again, like if somebody repeatedly abuses you or takes advantage of you or ignores you or they're, they're it doesn't matter how much you love them. They're, they're not going to experience that. They're not going to abide in it. They're not going to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there are a lot of ways it could go wrong. I guess there's really no point in it, listing them all. But again, if you're not keeping the commandments of God, it will be much harder for you to experience and know and um, apply that love in your in your life. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I have one more. What was your I There were other two one? others that I felt like went really well together, and, and they spoke back to back, Elder Holland and Elder Kieran. I loved Elder Holland's because he straight up mentioned suicide. Are they the same person? <laughs> they did make a joke about that, <laughs> and it was really funny. But I loved how Elder Holland mentioned suicide, and he talked about depression and the negativity that we see in the rising generation. There, It's just there's a lot that would give us reason to be hopeless. But he said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the compensatory, like combative way of going, like fighting against that negativity. Um, obviously not individuals. I'm not talking about like fighting individuals and that wasn't his message, but back against the ideologies that are so negative and mm -hmm. hopeless. The gospel, gospel means good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is what will combat the negativity that we see in the world and it will compensate us as we strive to overcome any hardships we may face. And I just loved that message because again, don't undercut what the gospel of Jesus Christ can do for you individually and it, what it can do for other people. And I feel like too many people, again, make exceptions for themselves or for others when it comes to living the gospel of Jesus Christ, or they just flat out don't understand it and, and or won't give it the time of day that would yield powerful results when facing hard times. Yeah. And then on the flip side, Elder Kieran's, I just loved how he talked about abuse and said that is it is evil. It is not appropriate in any context, any culture. You do not abuse other people. That's not okay. And if you have been abused, Jesus Christ can heal you. And I was just sitting there going, yes, like I've lived that. Literally overcoming abuse and healing from that. And the way that I did it was what Elder Holland said, and that was living the gospel of Jesus Christ so that I could be healed, so that I could abide in God's love and receive his full favor and, and blessings and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, I'm kind of, I thought was kind of rambly, no, but I just felt okay. like they went together really well. And two topics that are really close to my heart, and that is abuse and mental health Yeah. issues that people can have. That's good. Good little sidebar, I think. Yeah. What's your last one? Uh, my last one is, so Neil L. Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, th this one was kind of a good, not antidote, but like um, a good, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> balance? A good, yeah, a good balance for the other messages of, um, of not heeding what the wicked say and not listening to negative influences because just that alone is is good um but it's kind of like the balance of grace and truth if we are just if we just have that in mind we might err on the on the side of too much um well not too much truth but like or just disengagement like, yeah i feel like sometimes it's like if if we're not going to heed evil we just withdraw from society With, and yeah. that's not the solution either so he kind of presented the other idea and that is we're peacemakers mm -hmm. as followers of jesus christ and i liked his his um explanation of a peacekeeper mm -hmm. um he one of the things he said that i liked was children of god are not passive but persuasive so being a, a peacekeeper, that doesn't mean that there will never be conflict or that we don't ever engage in conflict because we don't want to hurt feelings or we don't want any sort of tension. That's not being a, a peacekeeper. Um, a peacekeeper is persuasive and does everything like sh you share your beliefs with conviction, but you avoid malice and contention mm -hmm. wherever possible. 
So I think that's an important distinction because a lot of times we get into this mindset that we can't engage with um, those who disagree or we don't want to ruffle any feathers or rock the boat at all. So we are just going to disengage and um, yeah, to disengage. Yeah. Like we're not going. Or we become overly aggressive and defensive right. and we lose the spirit because we are becoming the aggressor. Yeah. And I love the word persuasive because that that's a Christ-like attribute. We know that to be a Christ-like attribute. It's one that we aspire to and that's been pointed out by other apostles. And so I just think that I just loved the shout out to that Christ-like characteristic of being persuasive. Satan and those that like his tactics are manipulative, which is the corruption of that attribute. They won't tell you all of the truth. They'd rather manipulate the truth to manipulate you. Yeah. But persuasive people tell you everything that you need to know. Um, they lay it out. If, if it's good or bad or if it's both, they'll lay it out so that your choices are clear. And that's what I've learned so much about that. Like how Christ is persuasive to us. He educates us as much as he possibly can so that our choices are clear. Whereas manipulative people uh, don't want you to know the full truth because then your choices are limited and they can weasel you or um, corner you yeah. um, with bad options. I was I was listening to today um, kind of an example of this. It was, we've, we've quoted him before on the show, Jordan Peterson. He's a um, mm -hmm. psychologist and he, he's become kind of a, like a, polarizing figure um but is in my opinion just one of the most genuine seekers of truth out there and he's and quite like, eloquent he's very eloquent mm -hmm. and he um he's not weirdly enough we, my wife and i went to a um one of his lectures and it was at the at vivant arena so it was thousands and thousands of people and he's not the best public speaker mm -hmm. weirdly enough he's he's thinking about like he gives a different lecture every time and he is thinking about what he wants to say as he's saying it. So he's not like the most, um, I guess, entertaining public speaker in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. But if you really listen to what he's saying, it's so engaging still because what he's saying is just so prof like profound and yeah. anyway, um, rambling a little bit, but I was, he did an interview a while back and it was one of the interviews that kind of slingshotted him into the public eye a little bit. It was with a, um, a reporter from, I think, England. I think it was Kathy Newman or something. And she was grilling him on um, a lot of, of his beliefs and some things in his book. Um, and it's become it's become kind of a meme at this point, that, that whole interview, because he would say, or she would ask a question and he would answer the question and then she would say, okay, so what you're saying is this. And it was just like completely different than what he said or completely missing the point of what he was saying. And he's very careful with his words. Um, but I think that's so common. Like we, in interactions online, especially we'll run into people who don't, they just don't listen or like, don't try to understand what you're saying they project what they think you're saying onto you and can't see past that. And I think that's like, that's such a, su such a obstacle to uh, like online discussion mm -hmm. and having a civil discussion and disagreeing. Um, and so a lot of people, I mean, I, I know I've come across that and, been really discouraged and felt like I'd never want to engage with someone on the other side again. I mean, same. I've had similar interactions with people where you're like, never mind, I'm back to the catacombs. <laughs> but going into hiding. I mean, that's not being a peacekeeper. No, that's not that's not the right <laughs> so idea either. We yeah, it's a hard balance to strike for sure. Um, but one that's important. But I appreciated his reminder of that. He wasn't the only one. Um President Nelson also made that comment to that principle of we're peacemakers, peacekeepers. Um, this is a gospel of peace. One of Christ's titles is the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. And again, if somebody's combative and 
we struggle to de-escalate things, of course, maybe disengagement is warranted at that point. But we cannot just outright disengage from society. Um, we need to be representatives of Jesus Christ. And that will require tense conversations. But so long as they don't become like contentious where we're being aggressive and we're losing the spirit, then sometimes people can be persuaded to do good when they otherwise thought different. And that's kind of a good transition then into like the second half of what we'd want to talk about today. Yeah. And that is just the patterns that the antichrists in the book of Mormon followed is very uh, alive and well <laughs> today with people's tactics for pushing back against the prophets and pushing back against truth. Mm -hmm. um, so we just kind of wanted to kind of do an overview of who those people were in the book of Mormon. What were their, like the patterns of their behavior and their tactics and then modern parallels as well. Yeah. So as, as I mentioned earlier, there are four main ones um, that we studied for this. There was Zoram, Sherem, Korahor and Nihor. Mm hmm. Um, sad that they're antichrists because they're such good names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bummer. <laughs> I, I think a good place to start then would probably be to just mention that three of these four men had encounters with the prophet who in the Book of Mormon we call Alma the Younger. Um, his father had the same name. So this is Alma the Younger. But I just think it's interesting that three out of the four of them um, interacted with him and kind of had a, an exchange of words with him. Yeah. Because Alma the Younger used to be one of them. And I just think that's interesting. I, I I don't think it's an accident that these three people in particular and their tactics and their experiences are in the Book of Mormon. I just imagine Mormon, when he was compiling the Book of Mormon, was thinking like, you need to know that these people exist. And Alma handled them really well because Alma used to be one of them. Yeah, and And at the time that he did encounter them. Obviously he was a, a prophet and in good standing with the Lord, but can he you, could see right through their tactics. Can you relate to that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, not to be like, I'm so green, but it, again, like when you've walked away from the church far enough and engaged in certain discourses and had certain attitudes towards the church that are not positive and then come back wow, it makes things really obvious. It makes evil more obvious or yeah. mistruth more, or, or like we're about to talk about, it makes their tactics more obvious where I'm like, wow, it's so blatantly obvious what they're trying to do and how they're going about it. But anyway, I guess we should probably dive into it. But yeah, but yes, no, I've, I've noticed that too of like, man, I used to think some of this stuff. Like, this I, isn't I just, new. <laughs> I've just had that thought before that like, oh, Preston's kind of like Elmo the Younger. He had a little... Um, experience of like you weren't actively seeking to lead others away. I wasn't from, trying to destroy the church <laughs> like destroy he destroy the church. Wasn't but I quite certainly as was reading about people who wanted to destroy the church. And yeah, sympathized with them for a bit. Yeah, but yeah, no, I, I mean Alma. I'll sorry, Alma the Younger is my favorite prophet in the Book of Mormon for that reason. Yeah, his redemption story is amazing, and then just. He was just amazing the way he handled some of these these people in these situations. Mm -hmm. But we just wanted to highlight some of the like common tactics that they used. And then, of course, make the, the parallel to tactics that we see today from it could be individuals, right? Like Antichrist can refer to an individual, somebody that is Antichrist, but it could also refer to ideologies, right? It's not just a person. Mm -hmm. It could be an idea that we encounter online. Um, or just a general attitude that we encounter in our peers um, that is antichrist or against Christ and what his teachings are. Yeah, that, I think that's an important distinction because I know when I was younger, at least when hearing hearing that term antichrist, I thought of um, I thought it was like a specific individual and there was only one and mm -hmm. he was going to come in the last days and try to persuade all of us to, to not believe or, or whatever, but it, but it is a lot more, um, yeah, com complex than that. And there are, like you said, there's either ideas or it could be individuals. Individuals can move in and out of that, mm -hmm. um, space and can one, one day be antichrist and 
seeking to lead others away and yeah, yeah vice versa. and we've seen it we we've seen it with influencers or with people that were popular online mm-hmm. where yeah they can kind of go either direction they either get closer to christ or they get further away and from him and his teachings but yeah some of the main tactics though like one of the things that we kind of put our heads together and realized was there's lots of um half truths mm-hmm and one of the ways that they go about telling half truths is they use really inflammatory speech. It will be extremes. Um, in fact, Sharam and Korhor are both explicitly described as being masters of language. They were very eloquent men. They knew how to use the language to their advantage and used a lot of inflammatory speech. Like Korhor would talk a lot about how they were bound down by the traditions of their fathers. That's very, that evokes bondage, that evokes you're stuck. And Alma's counter to him was, why are you saying that people are in, in bondage? Like they're free, they're free to make their choices. Um, and they were just two years off of like a huge battle that that really rocked their nation. And it's he was just like, why are you talking about this this way when it that's that doesn't represent reality? So you'll see a lot of inflammatory speech, speech meant to stir up emotion that doesn't yeah. necessarily reflect reality. And if I remember right, like you mentioned, that was that was a time shortly after they like they were very prosperous. They were very happy mm-hmm. as a people. Um, and that's very reminiscent of today. Like we see that idea a lot of just exaggerating um, and flattering individuals by um, convincing them that they are victimized or um, oppressed in some deeply damning way Mm -hmm. i guess or crying fire when there is no fire yeah and and using because if if you're you know if you're told that you are a victim or oppressed in some way that that's a very um I guess a very enticing idea because then it's not your fault Mm -hmm. like your shortcomings or your um whatever it may be like inability to reach goals it's the the burden is is off of you Mm -hmm. so it's a very enticing idea and one that we see a lot in today's culture yep and and it's interesting too because that was another parallel or or common thread in all of these antichrist behaviors it always was to justify some some sin um if not like just wanton sin but um yeah, to to your point, Sky, that you just made, they they always were trying to justify something that was clearly established as sin by God. So yeah. Anyway, but the, but back to like the mistruths that you you had some really good examples when we were planning of yeah, kind of like these half truths too. So not only do they exaggerate and use inflammatory speech and use way too many superlatives, but they also will tell you some tr- something that is true, but they'll they'll twist it or they'll leave something out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, like ideas that I've run across online, um, especially with w- with um, I think I'd th- say members of the church who mm-hmm. I, th- I think members of the church who are um, either like disaffected with the church or angry about something or um, more, a lot of times more progressive with their political views. They, I, I'd say they are a lot more, um, I guess, dangerous to to the gospel and, and to um, members who want to keep their covenants because they are in it and like you they are in it with us and so i think they're a lot more persuasive to a lot of people Mm -hmm. so a lot of ideas that i've come across from um different influencers or or people like this would be god loves you how you are which is true and then the the half truth or the untruth after that is therefore you don't need to change or being lgbtq in the church is hard that's true you know generally speaking Therefore, you have it worse and you should not be expected to keep the commandments. That's the twist or the mm-hmm. the lie. Um, listening to disaffected and pain members is good. That's true in most cases. It's good to, to empathize with people and listen to their stories. 
Um, but and then therefore we should let them dictate our beliefs or our conduct. That's kind of where it, it the the lie comes in. Um, because taking advice from, I guess, m- more uh, bitter people is never a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good way to get good, solid information. Right. Um, I have some others. We receive revelation that is personalized to each of us. That's true. Therefore, we can receive revelations contrary to the commandments, and mine might differ from the counsel of the prophets. That's where it's the untrue twist. Yep. Um, we have agency, therefore I can use mine for whatever I want without natural consequences. Christ denied or dined with the sinners. True. Therefore, who I spend the majority of my time with won't affect my testimony. And and or another one is therefore he didn't care there were sinners. Like he mm-hmm. didn't try to change I've that. I've seen that one a lot lately. Yeah. That like Christ dined with prostitutes and tax collectors. And I'm like you fundamentally misunderstand that that is who they were when he met them. That is not who they were when they left with him. Mm -hmm. Like, Ooh, that, that argument drives me crazy because I'm like, that is not who they were when they followed him. That is who they were before they met him. And Oh, that just drives (laughs) me crazy. Cause again, yes, come as you are, but do not expect to stay as you are associating with Jesus Christ does not yield the same person that you were however long ago. I mean, fill in the blank. That, that variable can change. But ooh, yeah. that argument just drives me insane. Because I'm like, oh, <laughs> they weren't a prostitute anymore. They had repented. Like, they weren't an ex-tact collector. Like, no, he'd moved on. He'd gone back to his roots. Uh, yeah. That one got pressed in. D- yeah, sorry. That one just... <laughs> because it, no, it, I agree. it's such a blatant misrepresentation of Christ and his motives and yes. his effect on people yeah. that I just... Ooh, that burst, my, makes me bristle. <laughs> that has not been my interactions with him. <laughs> I came to him as a lot of different things, but I did not walk away from those conversations the same person. Wow. So don't you dare imply that he does not expect change of us. Don't you and, dare. And that we would, wouldn't be happier for it. Again, like... We're so much better off for it. Yeah, and he understands that. That's why that's why he dined with the sinners. It's, it wasn't just, I mean, it was to, to empathize. It was to show his love. But the ultimate expression of love is to help Call them, them to repentance. Be better. Yeah, which was President Nelson's, one of his main things from this conference was learn the joy of daily repentance. Yeah. That's what it means to be in association with Jesus Christ. He will ask that of you, daily repentance. Yep. Not, come on, prostitutes, let's go dine together. Like that, <laughs> that, that idea just seems so ridiculous to me. <laughs> and like so empty. I'm sorry, I, d- I didn't know that you were going to say that <laughs> <That's> one. <okay. laughs> like, I didn't bring that one up in planning, so <laughs> we're experiencing this in real time. <laughs> sorry, I will calm down, but yeah. But again, they, these tactics of mistruths, mm-hmm. partial truths, but not the whole truth. One truth, but not its companion truth. Right. We see that pattern in, in doctrine all over the place where there are principles that have a, a linking principle that put it in the proper context. We can talk about love all we want, but if it's not in the context of commandments and covenants, then we're not getting the full picture of what love looks like. Yeah, there's that if then mm-hmm. where, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, there's lots of pairing in in the doctrines for a reason to keep things in their proper context. And mm-hmm. so it just irks me when, <laughs> uh, when they pull truths. one out of context without bringing the companion with it. But anyway, I think I think that's why they're they are so common. Those half truths is because if if something is just a blatant lie, you're less inclined to or people are less inclined to believe it because it's so obvious. But Mm -hmm. if you can have a truth and kind of shimmy up a a half truth or a lie in there, it's a lot easier to fall for and and have sympathy for because a lot of times those half truths include, include things that are inherently compassionate, but then have something tied to it that takes away that compassion. Like Mm -hmm. that one, um listening let's see being lgbtq in the church is hard um or listening to disaffected and pain members is good like that's a compassionate thing 
therefore we should let them dictate our beliefs or conduct that's not a like that twists that compassion Mm -hmm. that makes sense yep and uh, another theme that we kind of saw from these antichrists too is they will try and disparage the character of the prophets um sometimes it's through a, a false accusation of some kind um but they'll do what they can to just again i don't know how else to wear that but to, to to make their character look flawed um if because if i can make you think that they're a bad person then you don't have to listen to the prophetic counsel that they've given yeah which i mean we've seen that about joseph smith we've seen that about modern prophets and apostles that we have today that are still alive people will say terrible things about them not knowing them personally um, in an effort to make them sound worse than they are. So then you won't even listen to their counsel. You're worried. Oh, he said the word musket. And like we're hung up on that word. And we don't know anything about this man. And so we outright dismiss anything that he said. So that's another common tactic is they're not good people. So you shouldn't listen to them. Yeah. I, and I was just thinking back to conference and especially President Nelson's remarks and just like how much love you can feel um, from him radiate. Mm -hmm. Like he always, he's just such a genuine man, genuine man. You can tell. Mm -hmm. And he's so good at portraying that Christ like love across the TV. Like you can still feel that he really does love all of us and is, is concerned about us. And it just makes me, um, sad that people can ex- like experience that and witness that love and see it as something so wrong or so, so evil. hostile they, they treat it like it's so hostile mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's sad because again they who reject this glad message shall never such happiness know like yeah people fight against this and and resist or downplay or just outright ignore Mm-hmm. And they miss out on just the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, another another pattern that we were realizing too is, um, oh shoot, it just left me. <laughs> <laughs> I have one I can bring, bring in. Apart. Yeah, you, know, okay. you go. I'm like, oh, I just I thought of it from something that you just said, and I I lost oh, it. Oh, sad. It'll come. Go. Okay. <laughs> What's the one, one you saw? The one I was going to bring up was um, a lot of times they will convince you. Let's see. They will, like like I mentioned, con- convince you you're a victim and then play with your emotions. Mm. Um, an example I saw of that online, I saw, I saw a lot of this ascent. <laughs> that was, I feel like I started speaking in pig, pig Latin or something. <laughs> um, I saw a lot of the sentiment online where... Um, it was kind of this idea of like a general conference briefing or debriefing where um, we, like you it's OK to be it's OK to be sad and distraught and hurt because of the words that you heard at conference. So let's talk about it. Let's debrief or like let's deconstruct the messages so that they no longer resemble their, their original meaning and mm. they are more palatable for you. I saw a lot of that general sentiment where it's, again, that that half truth, that compassion of it's OK if you're feeling upset, which is true. Like if you're in a if you're in a spot where you hear something from the prophets and it doesn't sit well with it, like it, it hurts you in some way, that's OK to feel that way. But then the lie comes in of, OK, let's talk about it and let's. Let's stay there, wallow in Let's it. Let's wallow in that and then... Water down the doctrine yeah, so you can have change, it in your sippy cup. Change the message to fit where you already are instead of changing where you are so that that message can go into your heart. Has a holding place, yeah. yeah. Yep. I, I remembered it. I oh, remembered good. It. Um, <laughs> they demand signs. That's, oh, okay. that's the other thing is... Um, I don't know if Zoram did, but... Um, or, or if Nihor did, but but it's a common theme too. It definitely happened with Sharon and Korhor is that they demand signs before they obey. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we see that a lot too modern. I, I won't do this unless God tells me or I unless I receive revelation that I should do it. Um, and it's like the prophets already told you 
what the will of God is. You already know what the commandments are, but your willingness to obey cannot be conditional on you having a perfect knowledge. Like mm-hmm. that's not how faith works. And it's not going to change you then if you do get a sign. It, it never, that's the other pattern that we see, especially with Laman and Lemuel. They were kind of antichrist too, if you think about it. But it, it signs don't change people. Having proof, the proof that they demand, again, they, they demand certain conduct it doesn't change them. Yeah. And then they're shorted out on having faith building opportunities that they could have had if they would have just engaged in that process. And we see that today. We mm-hmm. see um, a lot of people just kind of capitalizing on uncertainty, um, having the message of like specifically with the elder, um, or the president Oaks address about the family proclamation. Mm-hmm. I see it a lot with the family proclamation of, we don't know the f- what the future holds. So that revelation could change. Um, and what's so damaging about that is even if that were true, which I don't see how you can come to that conclusion, especially with after listening to President Oaks's talk and mm-hmm. him, him being so clear about that, how it's founded on irrevocable um, doctrine, I think is and the law phrase yeah. he used. Um, but kind of taking oh, what where I was going with that is what's so um, damaging about that is even if that were true, uh, we shouldn't live our lives expecting it to happen if we don't know it's going to happen. So it, it's kind of like they, the, the antichrists in the Book of Mormon and those today are very confident in their, um, like they're confident in, in their, their ignorance. ignorance. <laughs> no, really, that's what it comes down to. Like their ignorance is very obvious to people who are more educated. Um, but yeah, they're so confident in it. Um, Like Korhor, for example, he did not believe in Christ because he said you cannot know of things to come. You don't know that Christ is going to come and perform an atonement because you can't know the future. And the irony is he's telling us what's going to happen in the future. And so there's hypocrisy all over as well in what they teach of I'm so sure of this. And it's like, okay, but like you're doing the very thing that you're saying is bad. Like. Yeah, there's hypocrisy everywhere. Because implicit well. in in that message of we we can't know that Christ is coming, implicit in that is therefore we should act like he isn't. Mm-hmm. But you're now you're being so confident that like that you know he's not coming and you're acting like that, um, which is like you said, it's it's the exact same thing that you are um, accusing us of doing. To crying, so. yeah, and it and and to that example too of people expecting the doctrine to change on the family and. It, it just creates a whole lot of trouble and we're creating exceptions for ourselves because we refuse to accept the truth at face value. There must be something that will change in the future that justifies my sin. Because again, it's always about justifying one, if not more, sin. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. I I posted something about this this week about how damaging that message is of being either confident in or um or what's the word like being speculating about doctrine of the family changing um and having that message to lgbtq members of the church it's so parallel like paralyzing for Mm -hmm. them and it just gives them religious whiplash because they're they're learning one thing online and and see that message of oh yeah maybe maybe it'll happen like Mm -hmm. hang in there and then they hear the same message that we've been taught forever which is this is a an unchanging doctrine and so it's this back and forth and they're i I loved the way you worded it because you said too like then they're not able to make good choices like in the meantime i mean that's why it's paralyzing is then they're stuck in this funky limbo that all this mistruth is created Mm -hmm. and they're not making the choices that would help them move forward. Cause why give your life to something if it's going to change or if um, there, there's a chance that it'll change. Like why move your life in one direction? Say in our case, um, even though I love my wife so much and 
am so happy with with our marriage if I didn't have the foundation of the gospel and the understanding that God has a broader perspective and um, can see things that we don't and has defined marriage between a man and a woman. Because I know all of that, I pursued a relationship with a woman and have been pleasantly surprised with how happy and fulfilled that we are. But if I didn't have all that understanding and if it was all just up in the air, um, of course I would have pursued dating men because it was just natural. Like it's just... I mean, ditto. I, I, I would just add too, like having that doctrinal understanding of that man and a woman is ordained of God and that kind of a marriage unit, there was safety in pursuing that as well then too. I knew it was the one kind of relationship that would last forever. Mm-hmm. Um, who knows what happens between parents and children or uh, children and, and parents or siblings. They're like we don't know all of that. What we do know is that husband and wife, that relationship lasts forever. Those associations last forever. I, if I had married a man, I, I would have had no promise. And so there was no safety in pursuing that. But that came because of a doctrinal witness and under, or a, a witness of the doctrine, mm-hmm. um, having that doctrinal understanding. Yeah. And just like how confusing it would have been to have that wishy-washy, maybe it'll change, maybe it won't, yeah. maybe I should live my life this way, maybe I shouldn't. So dabble in sin in the meantime. And it's just, ugh, that's not... Yeah. Yeah. There is one other, um, I don't know the right word, but, um, oh, a pattern that we saw, um, particularly started, um, with Zoram. It was this religious superiority too, which we also see Mm. as well, that somehow they have the moral high ground that they're flawless, but they're really good at finding flaws in everybody else. And it's like, man, that's not correct either, which, I mean, that just... We don't really need to deep dive into that one, but it's just another form of behavior that we see from things that are anti-Christ is they're untouchable. They're above reproach, but man, do they have ideas about how everybody else should fix their problems. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I like to bring it all together, bringing it back to um, Elder Bednar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his emphasis on how the power to make good decisions comes from keeping our covenants. Like that's where, that's where it comes from. And, and I've definitely experienced that in my own life. Um, the power to, it's like, it's like a, a cycle. The, the power to keep your covenants comes from keeping your covenants. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like when you are, um, giving it your all and having the faith to, do things that you've received a witness are true, but you may not understand them fully. You, in in your pursuit to follow that um, direction, you are given power to keep going. And I, an, another talk that he gave that I really like, I think it was him, was the, um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's the Mormon message of stepping through the fog and mm-hmm. how... Like, Patterns of light and yeah. revelation, yeah. Yeah, we're only given enough to like enough insight to move a little bit into the fog and then the fog clears a little bit more and we have more faith to and understanding to move forward Mm -hmm. so that's been my experience in in everything in life with with following the gospel and um going off of those experiences in my life that have been the foundation of my testimony those experiences i've had that i can only explain as dealings with the divine and somehow Mm -hmm. those are the foundation for my testimony. And then the natural outgrowth of that is following the commandments. And from following the commandments, I've gotten more and more information and um, just enough to move little by little. Um, I'm rambling. No, I'll second that. I mean, again, ditto, same. These truths that I hold so precious and sacred are because of hard won (laughs) Uh, effort come from I worded that weird they come (laughs) from effort they are hard won whatever there we go um but yeah I I had to study and wrestle and pray and fast and really come to my own understanding of these doctrines and then was able to pray about it and receive my own witness that they're true and it 
comes from, again, personal experience, living it. You are promised no understanding and disobedience. Uh, that has never been the promise of, oh, here, let me just explain it all to you so that you'll obey. That's not how this works. Um, let me explain to you what needs to be done. And as you're doing that, I will continue to explain more. Um, it's the best learning process. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, okay. I think I'm calm now. I'm you're calm good. Down. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, I was just thinking after you stumbled on your words and all the times that I did, we must not be antichrists because we're not um, eloquent. Eloquent in our <laughs> words. <laughs> so um, you can well, trust us. No, maybe I can, if I could just flatter you a little bit, then I'm just kidding. You're not very flattering either. So. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't mean to be deprecating, but <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Well, um, for for our next episode, we wanted to um, put the call out there. We're going to end the episode next, not next week, but the next episode in two weeks um, with kind of a little Q&A mailbag type thing. So if you have any questions about our personal life or um, our favorite food or... Yeah. Or something maybe more Preston's like... hair products. <laughs> Tea tree. I can tell you now. Okay. Well, um, don't toss that one anymore. <laughs> Just, I don't, or, like, or our opinion on something gospel related or our, our experience being gay in the church or whatever you want to. Just send it as an email or find us on social media. Send a message. Leave a comment. Yeah. yeah. We'd like to be more pointed in as answering people's questions. Yeah. So, so let us know. If you have a question... Feel free to, to send one and we might answer it in the next episode. So, hoorah. Yeah. See you then. See you then.